Listener, Obscura is supported by people like you. And this month is the best month ever to join the Patreon. Because at the end of the month, I'm going to release an extra large black label. Think two plus hours long. And beyond that, you get access to a massive backlog of bonus episodes. Hours and hours of obscure content not released to the main feed. So head over to patreon.com slash obscure crime podcast to get access to bonus episodes, bonus content, and even merch. That's patreon.com slash obscure crime podcast. Thank you. Welcome, listener. I'm glad you're here. Take a seat next to the fire. Welcome to Obscura, where we shine a light on the dark. Randy Bain Jennings was born on June 30th, 1969. His mother would later be described as, quote, quite mentally ill by a criminal psychologist. Brandy Jennings suffered a number of head injuries between the ages of eight months and two years. During this period, the baby Jennings suffered a number of seizures. Jennings' mother breastfed him until he was five years old. She moved the pair around a lot, from Colorado to Wyoming to Oregon. According to Jennings' mother, Tawny, the pair lived in Oregon for the last nine years of Jennings' life. Then, they moved to Colorado for about a year and a half, moved back to Oregon for six months, then moved to Wyoming for a year, then moved back to Oregon for a year, then Arizona, and finally Florida, when Jennings was about 14 or 15 years old. During this period, his mother had many relationships with a string of men who varied in degrees of poor temper and drug abuse. Jennings never met his real father. His mother had an abnormal attachment to him when he was a child. Tawny was known to behave very oddly towards her son, and at least one person was witness to Tawny engaged in sex in the presence of Jennings. Tawny told Jennings at a very young age that she was a victim of sexual abuse, such knowledge can produce significant emotional distress in children, and it may have contributed to Jennings' later emotions and turmoil. He spent more than one night laying awake and imagining who the man may have been. Jennings stated that at one time he believed his uncle Sonny might have been that man, that he might be his biological father. There will be more on Sonny later. Jennings' father was a Native American Sioux Indian and she divorced him while she was pregnant with Jennings. Still, in school, he was a straight-A student with no behavior problems, and at whatever school he found himself in, he made a lot of friends. Jennings was later tested and described as gifted, but with learning disabilities that went untreated. Jennings' first sexual experience was at age six with a female cousin who was age 10. Jennings saw a psychiatrist when he was 8 years old due to his bad temper, including one instance where he choked his cousin for laughing at him. At age 12, he was raped by the older woman he babysat for. Jennings would tell others that he had been, quote, seduced by her, without any real understanding of the traumatic potential for such an experience. It goes without saying, listener, but a 12-year-old cannot consent. There is no sex with an older woman. That was rape. Growing up, Jennings was surrounded by some pretty terrible people. His maternal grandfather was overtly sexual with his daughters. Jennings' mother was sexually abused by her brother, George Sonny Jennings. Sonny Jennings' behavior was an open secret among the family, and instead of addressing the problem directly, they kept an eye on him and tried to keep the children out of reach. Jennings recalled that Sonny would pay him a quarter to sit and bounce on his lap in private. A man by the name of Walter Croom, who married one of Jennings' cousins, 
was also a child molester, and he occasionally babysat Jennings as well. Before we get too ahead, just to put things bluntly, during his preteen years, Jenny grew up in extreme poverty and neglect in an environment that involved the sexualization of children. This is an old case file that I'm reading into. I know 1995 doesn't seem that long ago to some of us, but back then, standards were different, and some of these things were more normalized. But looking at it objectively, this child was raped, and he was around a lot of sexual abusers. It's hard to know the extent at which it was carried out, because back then, men didn't exactly like admitting to such things happening to them. It was less understood, to put it mildly. Now, between the ages of 6 and 12, Jennings and his mother, Tawny, lived in a three-bedroom cabin-type room at the Oregon Buccaneer Motel. The room was once described as very, very messy, with clothes piled everywhere and dirty Kotex pads strewn about the apartment. There were puppy papers and dog poop left on the floor and dirty dishes everywhere. Tawny prepared quick, simple meals like toast with gravy or frozen hamburgers with a side of junk food, frozen chicken patties. You get the idea. Jennings regularly slept in the same bed with his mother until the age of 12. On one occasion, Tawny's sister observed three men stay the night in Tawny's motel while Jennings was there. The next morning after two of the men had left, Tawny and the remaining man were cuddled up together and unclothed. Jennings lay on the floor watching TV. Tawny had a lot of undisclosed health issues during this period. She had several operations and was soon addicted to pain pills. Lloyd, who was Jennings' uncle, thought Tawny was a bad mother, describing her as selfish, unemployed, and a poor housekeeper and cook. Lloyd testified that Jennings' uncle Sonny molested his wife Patricia, and Croom, one of the three sexual abusers floating around in the family, molested his and Patricia's son, and that Sonny and Croom had the opportunity to be around Jennings in private. When asked how Tawny supported herself, Lloyd stated that she was on welfare and speculated that she made money, probably hooking. Lloyd often took Jennings fishing, taught him how to box, and did other things with him. He was like a father figure, the lone one that he had in his life. But Lloyd lost touch with Jennings after Tawny moved from Oregon. Jennings' head injuries didn't stop after those that caused his seizures between eight months and two years old. In fact, he seemed to have suffered an unusual number of head injuries for any one person. He was hit in the head with a 2 by 4 of wood as a toddler, kicked in the head by a pony at age 4 or 5, punched in the face as a teen that led to a concussion, accidentally ran headfirst into a brick wall at age 16, engaged in a headbutting competition as a teen, was involved in multiple fights and suffered blows to the head, and was involved in a motorcycle accident. At age 15, Jennings and his mother moved to Florida, and the state wasn't a good fit. That, or a lot of emotions began to bubble to the surface. Jennings did not like the Florida school. He was bored. He felt rejected by his peers. He got into drugs, alcohol, and street racing. Soon Jennings got into a fight with one of his mother's newly acquired boyfriends. The man was known to send slights towards the angry teen, which I wouldn't have advised. Then one day, the boyfriend came home drunk, full of piss and vinegar, and in his drunken rage and confidence, he smacked Jennings' mother right in front of the boy. Let me tell you, from the reports, the man was in bad shape by the time Jennings was pulled off and needed to be hospitalized. Jennings dropped out of school shortly after that in his junior year of high school. After dropping out, he got into bar fights and was into acid, pot, and alcohol. 
He was known as a bruiser in the bar scene. He bounced around different jobs and partied. General, young, angry adult male things. 1989, when a man threatened a woman Jennings was dating, and what a mistake that was. Jennings kidnapped that man, and he had a firearm with him. He planned to kill the man, pointing the gun directly to his forehead and begging him to let him pull the trigger. He was later arrested and pleaded no contest to attempted armed robbery. Two experts would later state that Jennings had a sociopathic personality, an intermittent explosive disorder. These two personality traits combined made Jennings a ticking time bomb. He was sentenced to a year in county jail and five years probation. While in jail, he was in 30 or 40 fights, getting a reputation again as a bit of a bruiser, but he never got in trouble for it. Listener, I imagine Florida jails must have been like hell on earth in 1990. Now, in 1992, quote, his life kind of fell apart, and he got into heavy drugs and alcohol and moved back in with his mother. Kevin McBride was friends with Jennings when they were teenagers in Florida, and at one point, Jennings lived with him for a few months when Jennings' mother was in between places. He described Jennings' mother as a, quote, very nice lady who was always friendly but unstable financially. He recalled that Jennings and his mother were more like friends than mother and son. He stated that Jennings drank and used marijuana on a daily basis and he and Jennings used acid and mushrooms on occasion. Heather Johnson was good friends with Jennings for a couple of years when they were 17 or 18 years old. She stated that Jennings often expressed unhappiness, conflict, and resentment with his mother. Heather later elaborated that Jennings was her best friend, confidant, and protector, a big brother type who taught her things and made her feel safe. But he was also often foolish, and would do impulsive things without considering the consequences. She believed he acted out as a way to release the anger and frustration that he had a difficult time expressing, but she did not believe him capable of murder. In 1993, Jennings was having a conversation with his friend, Angela Cheney. He tells her that if he ever needed any money, he could always rob someplace or somebody. Cheney responds, That's stupid. You could get caught. Jennings replied, while making a cutting motion across his throat. Not if you don't leave any witnesses. In 1994, he moved in with a woman named Mary Hamler. One time when the couple were watching a news broadcast about a robbery, Jennings stated that, quote, he wouldn't be stupid enough to stick around. That he would go north. During this period, Jennings worked for a Cracker Barrel in Naples, Florida. He was angry with Cracker Barrel because they told him to cut off his ponytail if he wanted to advance. This infuriated Jennings as he considered his ponytail a part of his Indian heritage. Still, he cut off his ponytail and had a grudge against Cracker Barrel when he was not promoted. Jennings held the assistant manager, Dorothy Siddle, particularly responsible, and told Hamler that one day, quote, that bitch would get hers. Though he loved Hamler's three kids, Jennings soon discovered something curious. He didn't feel a thing at all for Mary. Not a thing. When he brought her image to his mind, there wasn't a single pang of emotion. Turns out, she was just someone to use for a place to stay. And... After he and Hamler called it quits, Jennings moved in with a friend and co-worker, Jason Graves. The pair both worked for the same Cracker Barrel. Jennings continued to perceive Siddle as someone who was holding him back at work. After Jennings finally quit, he said about Siddle, I hate her. I even hate the sound of her voice. Another friend who worked at Cracker Barrel remembers Jennings' animosity and dislike of Siddle and that Jennings had once said about Siddle, I can't stand that bitch. I can't stand her. I can't stand the sound of her voice. 
detective came and knocked on the door and I said, is it Renee? And he just gave me that solemn look. It was the worst day ever. The Proof Podcast is back with a new case and a new season. 23 years ago, 18-year-old Renee Ramos went missing. Her body was later found in an empty Home Depot building on the edge of town. I don't think that they arrested the right people. It's about time somebody's trying to do something. She had a black eye about two weeks before she was murdered. They are involved. They definitely had her body and her backpack. You know people are going to judge you, right? Of course. They're judging me now. They've been judging me damn near my whole life. You can listen now to season two of Proof, wherever you get your podcasts. And follow along with us as we reinvestigate the murder at the warehouse. I have to ask, did you kill Renee? American Criminal is a new true crime podcast from the studio behind American Scandal and American History Tellers. Every week, you'll fall deeper into the riveting stories of the country's most clever, craven, and cruel criminals. Fraud, theft, murder, and worse. Whatever the case, whoever the criminal, you don't know the whole story until now. The debut season tackles one of the most sensational cases of the 20th century, the Menendez murders. In 1989, young Lyle and Eric Menendez brutally shot their own parents. Prosecutors and the press said it was a multi-million dollar inheritance that led two greedy rich kids to murder. But the picture-perfect facade this Hollywood family built hid troubling abuse. Could these teenagers have been driven to kill? Or was it even in self-defense? Listen now. Go to AmericanCriminal.com or search for and follow American Criminal wherever you get your podcasts. November 15th, 1995, Naples, Florida, Cracker Barrel. 18-year-old night maintenance man Jason Wiggins stayed overnight to clean up. Assistant manager Dorothy Siddle, 38, arrived around 4.30 a.m., and 27-year-old cook, Vicki Smith, showed up about 10 minutes later. And soon, chaos would unfold. Upon arriving at the scene, police found the bodies of all three workers lying in pools of blood on the freezer floor with their throats slashed. Victim Siddle's hands were bound behind her back with electrical tape. Smith and Wiggins both had electrical tape around their respective left wrists, but the tape appeared to have come loose from their right wrists. Police also found bloody shoe prints leading from the freezer through the kitchen and into the office where the money was held. Blood spots in and around the kitchen sink and an opened office safe surrounded by plastic containers and cash. Outside, leading away from the back of the restaurant, police found scattered bills and coins, shoe tracks, a buck knife, a buck knife case, a pair of blood-stained gloves, and a Daisy Air pistol. Jennings and Jason Graves, both of whom had previously worked at the Cracker Barrel and knew the victims, were apprehended and jailed approximately three weeks later in Las Vegas, where Jennings ultimately made statements to Florida law enforcement personnel. In a taped interview, Jennings blamed the murders on Graves, but admitted his involvement in planning and, after several aborted attempts, actually perpetrating the robbery with Graves. Jennings acknowledged wearing the gloves during the robbery and using his buck knife and taping the victim's hands, but claimed that, after doing so, he must have set the buck knife down somewhere and did not remember seeing it again. Jennings further stated that he saw the dead bodies in the freezer and that his foot slipped in some blood but that he did not remember falling, getting blood on his clothes or hands, or washing his hands in the kitchen sink. Jennings also stated that the Daisy Air Pistol belonged to Graves, and directed police to a canal where he and Graves had thrown other evidence of the crime. According to friends Angela and Michael Lobdell, Jennings came to their home the day after the murder, and he was not acting any differently. Additionally, another friend, McBride, testified that the day before the robbery, Jennings told McBride that he was working at a mall on a construction job and that he was getting paid the next day and would be heading to California. 
in an untaped interview the next day, during which he was confronted with inconsistencies in his story and the evidence against him. Jennings stated, I think I could have been the killer. In my mind, I think I could have killed them, but in my heart, I don't think I could have. At trial, the taped interview was played for the jury, and one of the officers testified regarding Jennings' untaped statements made the next day. The items ultimately recovered from the canal were also entered into the evidence. The medical examiner who performed autopsies on the victims testified that they died from sharp force injuries to the neck caused by a sharp blade instrument with a very strong blade. Like the buck knife found at the crime scene, a forensic serologist testified that traces of blood were found on the buck knife. The buck knife case the area around the sink, and one of the gloves recovered from the crime scene, but in an amount insufficient for further analysis. An impressions expert testified that Jennings' tennis shoes recovered from the canal matched the bloody shoe prints inside the restaurant, as well as some of the shoe prints from the outside tracks leading from the restaurant. Jennings' friend and confidant Graves was 18 years old at the time of the crimes, and the state strangely agreed to waive the death penalty in Graves' case in exchange for his waiver of motion for continuance to allow him more time to prepare for a capital trial. Graves was convicted on all charges in a separate proceeding and sentenced to the only available sentence, life imprisonment. In 1996, Jennings was convicted of all three counts of first-degree murder and one count of robbery with a deadly weapon. In preparation for the sentencing, Jennings was interviewed by several crime psychologists and experts. Thomas Osteen, who had extensive capital case experience at the time he represented Jennings, testified that an investigator, a court-appointed psychiatrist, Dr. Robert Wald, and a court-appointed psychologist, Dr. Russell Masterson, assisted him with preparation for Jennings' trial. And the penalty phase, Dr. Masterson conducted various tests on Jennings, and the results were all within normal limits. Dr. Masterson opined that Jennings had a superior intelligence, and his testing results revealed no evidence of psychotic process, but suggested a personality disorder, characterological disorder, and sociopathy. In addition to Osteen's testimony, at the state post-conviction evidentiary hearing, Jennings presented testimony from three experts in support of his claims. Dr. Thomas Hyde, a behavioral neurologist, Dr. Hyman Eisenstein, a clinical psychologist and an expert in neuropsychology, and Dr. Faye Sultan, a clinical psychologist. Dr. Hyde and Dr. Eisenstein both testified that Jennings suffered from a number of closed head injuries and had a history of seizures. Dr. Hyde opined that the seizures were a typical indicator of abnormal brain function and that a history of head trauma may predispose a person to some long-lasting neurological effects from brain damage. Dr. Eisenstein opined that the following statutory mitigating circumstances applied to Jennings. 1. His capacity to appreciate the criminality of his conduct or to conform his conduct to the law was impaired. And 2. He was under the influence of extreme mental or emotional disturbance when he committed the murders. Dr. Salton explained that Jennings was highly intelligent, likely to be a serious substance abuser, had difficulty controlling his anger, was easily frustrated, extroverted, had a rigid personality, and was able to have relationships with other persons, but they were not likely to be long-lasting ones. This due to Jennings' learned behavior of using those who trusted him. Dr. Salton also opined that Jennings had an intermittent explosive disorder. She further opined that Jennings did not suffer from any mental illness and that he did not meet the standards for Florida's statutory mitigators. Nevertheless, she thought Jennings was quite a damaged person who operated in the world in a highly dysfunctional way. In court, the state emphasized that Jennings and Graves wore gloves so as not to leave identifying fingerprints. The state pointed out that they had masks with them in the truck, 
and Jennings admitted in a statement to law enforcement that the initial plan had been to wear masks and snatch the money. The state argued that they chose not to wear the masks because they knew there was no reason to wear masks. They were going to eliminate the witness. The state also pointed to the testimony from the guilt phase that Jennings stated that if he ever committed a robbery, he would not leave any witnesses. The state argued that Jennings carried the knife and killed the victims in a very personal way, one by one, and that the blood led to the money after the murders. The state emphasized that there was evidence of calculated premeditation, including that Jennings attempted to set up an alibi. He and Graves brought tape with them to bind the victims. They wore gloves. They hid the trunk. They registered in a hotel both before and after the crime using their own names, which demonstrated that they were not concerned about being linked to the crime because they knew they were not leaving any witnesses. The day after Jennings went to a friend's house and was not acting any different, the jury deliberated approximately an hour and a half and returned a 10 to 2 recommendation in favor of the death penalty for each of the three murder counts. Brandy Bain Jennings was ultimately sentenced to three death sentences for the murder of Vicki Smith, Jason Wiggins, and Dorothy Siddle, and 15 years in prison for the robbery charge. On December 14th, 2022, the Tampa Bay Times reported that Jennings attempted to appeal his death sentence. In the appeal, he contended that he had received ineffective legal representation before being sentenced to death, at least in part because his attorney did not adequately investigate and present mitigation evidence related to his childhood and background. The appeals court panel rejected the argument and backed rulings by the Florida Supreme Court and Federal District Court. Out of options, Brandy Bain Jennings now spends his days waiting to be executed by lethal injection. And that about wraps things up. I had gotten a few messages recently, specifically on the Facebook, of people that wanted an old-school style of Obscura that didn't lean so much into source audio. So I thought I'd take the time and write out an episode covering things the way that I did from the beginning, right? You got to look into the childhood, what led to the recipe of this particular killer's sociopathy, and the ultimate conclusion of their story. In this case, lethal injection. Unless a miracle occurs. But yeah, I hope you enjoyed, and I hope this pleases the people that kind of want just the straightforward narrated episodes. I thank you for listening, and keep the fire burning.